Well, we, uh, I think we've got just about everybody here, so let me, let me go ahead and open us up with prayer, and we'll go ahead and get started this evening. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your blessings to us again and allowing us to be together this evening. Thank you for your goodness to uphold us and provide for us and deliver us from evil and help us in every way to honor you. And we thank you for all your blessings. Help us to respond with gratitude and grant us grace to be thankful people all our days and be able to rejoice in you no matter what happens around us. Help us to trust in you and remember your promises and strengthen us and teach us now uh, so that we can grow in wisdom and be able to glorify your name in the midst of this generation. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> well, uh, we live in a world, as you know, that's rapidly losing the knowledge of fundamental things that are necessary for civilization. I don't know if we're losing it or kicking it out or rejecting it, but the fact is that men no longer believe things that, were, that are absolutely essential for society for human beings to exist safely and securely and do so with profit and joy. And this is why we wanted to start these classes, um, at least to try to do something, to make an effort to try to preserve some of the foundational truths that are essential to culture and civilization. So we want the Bible being taught. The Bible is, is the most important thing, and that's why We'll always have a class on that. But we also wanted to address some of these other things that are being discarded in our day <clears throat> that are truly things necessary for us if we are to live and fulfill the purpose of our creation, the purpose for our existence. The things that we see being systematically attacked, denounced, and destroyed in our day. Well, this Easter season, I wanted to look the Easter session, I wanted to look at how we are to understand the Constitution and why that's important and uh, a answering some of the questions like why do we have a Constitution in the first place and why has constitutionalism been historically important to Christians? It's something the church has emphasized throughout history. What is the purpose of this? Why should we support and defend the idea as well as the document that we have in our country? These are questions that most people don't even consider to be important enough to answer, uh, much less to understand or even to give any time or thought to considering. Uh, but they are important. <clears throat> if we can't answer these questions, we are going to lose an important pillar of our culture we are going to lose our civilization. So before we get into a study of the Constitution itself, I wanted to take uh, a, an evening to think about the whole idea of constitutionalism. Why is a constitution important? Where does this idea come from? What are its origins? Uh, and the first thing we need to know is that the idea of a constitution didn't begin in 1787 when our constitution was composed and with the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, nor did it begin in 1620 with the Mayflower Compact, or, and it even didn't begin in 1215 with the Magna Carta. Rather, it began, like other things, it began in the Garden of Eden. It begins at the beginning. Adam, remember, was created to be the first ruler of the world. He was to have dominion over the creation as God's representative, as God's vice regent, it's often said. He was created in God's image for that reason. So he is the first king, and he's a king in training, of course, in, in initially. But you see that even though Adam was sinless in the beginning, he was not allowed to rule over the earth according to his own thoughts or opinions. He didn't really have any experience. He had very little idea, of course, of what it was going to involve. So, but the point is, like all kings who would follow him, he is to be a servant, a minister of God, God's representative on earth. And Adam, as God's representative, didn't have absolute authority. He was not free to determine for himself and for the world what was good and evil or lawful or criminal. Rather, he was given God's word as, he, uh, as his rule of faith and life, his rule of conduct as the king of the world. 
and he was obligated to obey the word that God gave him. So the word of God was, in effect, his constitution. He would be held accountable by God for his obedience or his disobedience to God's word. His word, God's word, prescribed his authority and the limits of that authority. And so we need to understand the idea of constitutionalism is founded, first of all, in the reality of God's sovereignty. He's the creator and the king. He alone has all power and authority. He alone, then, is able to declare the standard of what is righteous and just. And he alone can do this because he created all things, and thus he knows all things comprehensively and thoroughly. He has all knowledge in himself. He alone, then, is qualified to tell us what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is just and unjust, what is wise and foolish, because he alone is all-knowing. Before you could say anything for absolute, you remember I've, we've gone over this before, but before you can make any absolute statement, you have to know everything. And that's why men cannot make absolute statements. They can't say that something is absolutely true because you'd have to know all there is to know to be able to make that claim. So men try to enforce their own opinions on others so that history becomes a power struggle. Who is going to get enough power to enforce their will on everybody else? And that's what we see going on today. You can see it in all these movements and all the things that are going on. Black Lives Matter, they really, uh, that's really not the point. It's a nice name for an organization that wants power. They want power over everybody else. And uh, whether black lives or anybody else's life is helped is, is secondary. And so that's the way it is here. The sovereignty belongs to God. And the idea of constitutionalism is founded on the fact that God is sovereign. He's the creator and king. And so he is the one who rules over us, and everyone has to submit to his word if they are to live faithfully and fruitfully as his creatures and representatives. Now, because God is absolutely sovereign, man can never be autonomous. The word autonomous means be your own law, a self-rule or self-law. You're not allowed to rule yourself. You're, uh, you're not allowed to become a law to yourself or make up your own laws. That would be to act like God or to claim or usurp God's authority. That was, in fact, the sin of Adam. That was what happened in the beginning in the garden. He was, when, when he embraced Satan's lie, he was seeking to be a God to himself. Remember Satan, God had said, you shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the, of the garden, because in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And Satan's lie was a, a direct contradiction of that. You shall not die. You will not surely die. He says he actually negates and quotes God exactly. He just negates the, the, the phrase. And so Adam now has to make a determination. Who's telling the truth here? God told him very plainly in the day he ate of it, he would die. Satan says, no, you won't die. God just said that because he doesn't want you to be like him. And the implication, of course, is that God is unjust. So Adam now is set up as the judge. He's going to judge who's right and wrong. He's going to determine what is good and evil for himself and take the, take the fruit of this tree that will actually give him that ability is what he thinks. That's his plan. And so he seeks to be his own God at that point. He rejects the living God and actually becomes the slave of Satan, though he doesn't realize it. Now, this is the fundamental sin of all mankind. All men want to cast off God's authority and live as they please. They want to follow their own desires, their own opinions, their own views of life, and think that that's okay, that's, that's reality for them. So the first foundation for constitutionalism is the absolute sovereignty of God, that God alone possesses absolute authority over all areas of life. And if any ruler or king or government claims authority over all areas of life, that is not only tyranny, it is also blasphemy. It is an attempt to be God or take God's place. And further, you see the implication of this, to acquiesce to the tyrannical usurpation of God's prerogatives is in fact to deny 
God and his absolute lordship over all things. It's denying Jesus. And, and, and so one of the political slogans of Calvinism, of the Reformation, was no, the crown rights of King Jesus. We were trying to claim and restore the crown rights of King Jesus. And the founders of our Constitution made that very plain. That was one of the things that they wanted to preserve God's sovereignty because God's sovereignty is central, essential to the preservation of liberty. You have heard this quote from William Penn, famous statement. He says, if men will not be governed by God, they will, they must be governed by tyrants. You have a choice, Penn says. You will either submit to God or you will have to submit to Satan and Satan's, Satan's rulers who are tyrants over you. They will claim all authority over you. But not only are constitutions necessary because God is the sovereign, but because, secondly, man is sinful. Man is, the, man is self-seeking. He's self-worshipping by nature. He's self-loving. So man on his own will not seek the well-being of his neighbor or those around him. He will seek those things that promote his own advantage at the expense of those around him. He will not love his neighbor as himself. He must be held accountable, therefore, to a law, a constitution, that clearly defines his authority and duty and holds him accountable for rebelling against the law that is over him. And that's, in part, the job of constitutions. And so the second truth that necessitates a constitution is the sinfulness of man. And the founding fathers, of course, believe this. They believe the Bible's teaching that man is not naturally inclined to, to do good, but is a sinful creature. He's inclined, therefore, to do evil. And because of this, all human authority must be strictly limited. It must be defined and strictly limited. Man is sinful and cannot be trusted. And so Thomas Jefferson says, free government is founded on jealousy, not on confidence. It is jealousy and not confidence which prescribes limited constitutions to bind those we are obliged to trust with power. In questions of power, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. So our Constitution is built on this reality. God is sovereign, man is sinful, therefore man cannot be trusted with unlimited power. You have to define it, you have to, you have to, uh, subscribe, you have to subscribe it so that it's strictly limited, and that we can tell when a man is going beyond his authorized authority. Society, if there is to be society, has to be ordered and structured. There have to be those who have been given authority to rule in the various areas of life and who have authority to enforce the rules of order of the law so that men are not free to do whatever is right in their own eyes. If we have a civil, if we're to have a civilization, a Christian civilization, then sinners must be restrained by law and lawful authorities who uphold the laws of God as they are applied to citizens. So all of us, when it gets down to it, live under the constitution of God's word. We as individuals have his law, which defines us. It defines us and it defines for us what is good and evil. How do you know what is right or wrong? How do you know what is good and evil? How do you know what's good for you or bad for you? How do you know what's wise and what's foolish? Well, you learn the Bible to do that. If you sit around meditating, just humming to yourself or piecing out or whatever you want to call it, or using drugs, you're not going to come to the truth. You've got to know what the one who knows everything says. So we have to know the Bible. We as individuals then have God's law, which defines for us what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is acceptable and unacceptable. And God holds us accountable for our obedience and chastens us for our disobedience. Sometimes he chastens us directly, but most of the time he chastens us through those whom he set in authority over us. So we come into the world under government, don't we? You come into the world under the authority of a father and mother who are God's representatives, and they have the authority of God to rule over you and to uphold his word in his behalf for you. 
So you have parents. Then you, as you grow up, you then have teachers. Maybe your parents are your teachers, or you go to a school, and you have teachers, and they have authority. They have authority to teach you and to enforce their teaching and keep, the, keep order in the classroom. And, of course, we then are born into a particular country. We have rulers over us who have authority. All of these are God-ordained authorities, and they're to rule over us as God's representatives. But those whom God places over us are themselves accountable to him and the laws of his word and the Constitution. They are required to follow and enforce not their own whims or their own desires, but his word. They are to be faithful ministers of God, and a faithful minister does the will of God. So parents don't have absolute authority over their children. They have God-given authority, but that authority is limited. They are to train up their children, not according to their own opinions or what the psychologists say, but they are the opinions of others. They are to follow, they are to train up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In other words, we've been given a child-rearing standard that we're to follow. We can, get it, we can get, of course, advice and counsel from others that help us along the way and how to apply these things. But we have a standard by which we have to train up our children, and that's the word that God has given us. We are going to try to follow that word as best we are able, bringing up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And when we do that, we are acting in God's place, and children have to obey. And you see, under, uh, uh, children, you remember this, that it's not an option to do what mom and daddy say. If they're commanding you to do something that is within the, the Bible's authority that God has given them, you have to obey or you're sinning against God. It's not just sinning against mom and dad. It's a sin against God himself because your parents represent him. And if you despise them... If you don't honor them, you are not honoring him. You're despising him. That's the way this works. God has his authorities that represent him, and when they act in his name faithfully, they are acting, uh, they are acting in his name, and therefore to refuse to, re to respect them is to disrespect God himself. So teachers are to do the same thing. They're to teach in God's behalf as his representatives. Elders and pastors in the church are God's representatives. They're God's ministers, and they're to instruct God's people in God's word and hold people responsible for obeying it. If a minister starts telling you all his own ideas and never explaining the word of God, then he's not being a faithful minister, and you have the right to ignore what he's saying if he's only giving you opinions. His authority exists within the word and through the word. Employers who are to exercise their authority over their employees in accordance with God's word. Uh, Paul gives instructions to employers and how they're to operate. They represent Jesus and are to rule over their employees just as Jesus rules over them. And rulers in the state are to rule as God's ministers, applying his word in the laws that they make as well as in the administration of those laws that are made. So that's the way it's set up. And conversely, children and students and employees and, and members of the church and citizens in the state are to honor those in authority in the Lord is the, is the directive that we are given. That is, we are to obey them in all things unless they command something contrary to God's word or usurp authority that God has not given them. In other words, they try to snatch authority that they don't rightfully hold. It's not been delegated to them by the Bible or the Constitution. Now you see, what all of this means is that Christianity is essential for civilization. I didn't say that it's one good way for civilization to operate. I said it is essential. There is no such thing as a civilization apart from Christianity. We've last in our last session in the in the uh, in the um, a Lenten session, we looked at some of the ancient. Uh, the Native American religions, they could not produce what we call civilization because their religion is idolatrous, it is destructive and murderous. And that's the way all unbelieving 
religions, that's the society they produce. Uh, R.J. Rushton, he called it the Society of Satan, and that's a great title. That's what it is. Unbelieving, unbelieving faiths produce the Society of Satan. Only Christianity produces a civilization like the one we have grown up in for the most part, and, and what has been true in the West for at least a thousand years. So what we see is that biblical Christianity is essential for a well-ordered society. Civilization is ultimately impossible apart from submission to God and his word. Now we know this on a lesser level, don't we? we every Christian, if I were to ask a Christian, how can, can you have a blessed marriage if you're not a Christian and your husband's not a Christian or you're a Christian and he's not or he is and you're not and you're fighting all the time. Is that going to be a blessed, happy relationship? The answer is no, it's not. It's not. That's not the way we, we want a happy, blessed relationship, but that means we have to marry in the Lord. That's what we're called to do. You marry a faithful Christian who submits to God's word like you do. You can't have a blessed family unless fathers and mothers take seriously their obligation to be faithful as God's representatives, loving their children, speaking the truth, giving the, bringing up the children in the nurture and discipline of God. You can't have a blessed church if the minister and the rulers are not serious about faithfully teaching God's word and upholding that word and the authority of the word. But what we have to remember is this, what's true of us as individuals and what's true of us in our marriages and in our families and what's true of us in the church is also true when it comes to the country, the state. We have to remember that if we're going to have a blessed country, we have to submit to God. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation Sin is a reproach to any people. You can't have a nation that is neutral religiously. You're either going to serve Christ or Satan. There's no third alternative like, oh no, we just want to be neutral. You cannot be neutral. There's no neutrality. Jesus has taught us that. And this verse tells us that. There is such a thing as righteousness. And the opposite of that is sin. Righteousness blesses a nation. It exalts a nation. Sin becomes a reproach, a destruction to any people who live in an unrighteous, wicked situation. That's the way it is. The authorities which are established by God are, are his servants and thus require to rule in accordance with his word. And they also are held accountable to him for the exercise of their authority. Now, this is through, through clear. I think it's implied. You could just take Proverbs 14 and just say, okay, let's think through that and apply it. I think you can legitimately do that and just say, here's a Christian form of government. Let's take, take that verse. But the Bible's filled with stuff that show us how this works. Deuteronomy 17, for example, God here lays out the rules, the requirements for the king that Israel is to choose. And look at what he says. When you come to the land which Yahweh your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom Yahweh, your God, chooses. One from among your brethren, you shall set his king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For Yahweh has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now look, here's the thing. Pagan kings viewed themselves as gods. The Pharaoh viewed himself as the son of God. The, in fact, the revelation, the incarnation of the sun god. Every pagan ruler viewed themselves as God incarnate. Uh, 
And thus they had this idea of the divine right of kings. You've heard uh, King James and some of the kings of England claim this divine right to impose their wills on their subjects without any restraint. They could do whatever they pleased. But God makes it clear that Israel's king was to show the world how the rulers are to rule. He's to be an example to all rulers. Notice what our requirements are. God forbids the king of Israel to be a foreigner. And the reason is not because he doesn't like foreigners, because foreigners are pagans. He said, you, can, you must have somebody who is your brother. You have to have somebody who is a brother in the faith. You can't have an idolater. You can't, he, and, 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 and the king that we get is not to multiply horses. The reason, of course, is horses are instruments of war. You're not to have a standing army that sits around wishing it had a war to fight because if you've got them standing around, somebody's going to say, hey, why do we have those guys standing around? And you'll find some place to put them and fight them and get in a war. So he's not to have an instruments of war. He's not to multiply wives. That is, he's not to be immoral, nor is he to enter into entangling alliances with idolatrous nations, foreign nations. That's what taking many wives involved, making treaties. That's one of the ways you built alliances with other nations. And, and, you're, and you, we see this in history, you know, in, in modern history, too, where all these, uh, the, the kings and queens of England and Spain and, and uh, all the other countries tried to marry out their children so they'd be connected. And all of them, of course, wanted to be the king of the world. But um, that was the whole idea. Well, the king of Israel is not to do that. Not only that, because he would be tempted then to go into idolatry because his wives are going to lead, turn his heart away. And then notice that he's not to multiply silver or gold. He's not to use his position to enrich himself. Now there's a novel idea. A politician is not supposed to use his position to get rich. And this is one of the reasons why if you're going to vote for somebody, if you're going to have a guy, we hope to have a, a guy of godly character. But if we can't, I want somebody independently wealthy who has in some integrity, who actually knows what is right and wrong. Because he has really nothing to gain. He doesn't need, the, he doesn't need uh, the media fawning all over him. He doesn't need fame. He doesn't need money. But unfortunately, we don't have, we have very few men like that. And, and uh, we end up getting all kinds of trouble because these are unprincipled men who are there for their own well-being, not for yours. He has to, and this is interesting, that the king of Israel had to write out his own copy of the law. He had to write out a copy of the Torah for himself. And he was to read in it. So he not only just had this thing, which would take a pretty good bit of time, but he also had to read it so that he could learn to fear God and be a faithful minister of God. The king is a minister of God, and so he must serve as God commands. Therefore, he has to be familiar with God's word, God's law. And Paul, you see, expands on this in Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now we need to note a number of things about this. The first thing is that Paul is speaking of all authorities in general, all God-ordained authorities, be it in family, in the church, um, in the state, whatever, wherever there is a God-ordained authority. This is just a general, here's the way we're to think about authorities, the authorities that God puts in a, in a position of authority over us. And then when he applies this to the civil rulers, he's not obviously uh, directing it to any particular state or ruler, though there was a very famous ruler in, on the, uh, as the emperor of Rome at this time who would be very unhappy with Romans 13, by the way. 
but he's setting it down as this is the way it is for all rulers. So he's not saying our present Roman emperor is this way. He's saying this is the way every ruler ought to be. And this is why tyrants have never taken comfort in Romans 13. Christians think, oh, Romans 13, you have to do whatever the the government says to do. Then if that's true, why do tyrants hate Romans 13? Why did Nero get furious over Romans 13? He hated this because of what it says. Christians don't listen to the Bible very carefully, and they would have been... They would have been, you know, most Christians in our day would have never lasted 10 minutes in the first century because they're so naive about all these things and don't listen to the scriptures. Anyway, Paul is setting down what must must be true of all rulers as rulers of God. And thirdly, all authority comes from God. Paul makes it clear. God alone has unlimited authority over all things. And so if all authority belongs to God, then that brings us to the fourth thing. No institution has been invested with unlimited authority over all areas of life. All authority is limited. God alone has absolute unlimited authority over all. But that leads us to the fifth thing. Every institution derives its authority from God and thus is answerable to God. No family, no church, no state is independent or out from under God's rule. All have been ordained by him, and all are obligated to obey his word. In other words, every institution is required to be distinctively Christian or it's illegitimate. If any family, church, or state seeks to cast off the authority of God, at that point they are rebelling against God, they are usurping unwarranted authority, and they are under the condemnation of God. At that point... The authority, whoever he might be, forfeits the right to subjection and obedience of those under his authority. If you are going beyond the authority of God, if you're commanding things that God forbids, if you're going beyond the authority God has given to you, then you forfeit your right to the, uh, to the obedience of the people under your authority. And that leads to the sixth thing, the state's authority is not all-inclusive, but strictly limited. This is made plain by what Jesus says in Matthew 22. We're going to come back to this in a moment, so you know the passage. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God's, the things that are God's. The ruler is strictly limited by God's word as to what he can legitimately do, and that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 22. But that leads us to the next thing, the state is not a neutral entity. It is directly under the authority of God. It is to rule according to God's word. Rulers are ministers of God and thus are obligated like all other ministers to be faithful to God. What would you think if you had a pastor who said, you know, I just want to assure you that I'm not really uh, for God. I'm kind of neutral. So we're going to look at all sides and I hope you'll just enjoy the ride. We're going to look at all, you know, like walking through a museum. We're going to look at all views, all positions, all perspectives. Why would you pay that guy's salary? Why would you let him do anything? Ministers are not neutral. If God has put you in position, you are his minister and thus you're to be faithful to him and you're held accountable for that. The state has no right to pretend to, pretend to be religiously neutral toward God and his word. For a ruler to seek to be neutral is to rebel against his God-appointed position and calling as a ruler. He is called to rule over God's people in the same way that other ministers rule. So, he is to be governed by the word of God, living in accordance with it, following it. He can't write his own job description. God has given it to him. He has to follow that word. His position is ministerial, not legislative. That is, he can't make laws contrary to God's word. He has to take God's word and apply it to the people. As a minister, then, he's answerable to God and will be judged according to his faithfulness or unfaithfulness. It's a contradiction for a minister to do anything except carry out the instructions and responsibilities given to him by God. If he doesn't do that, then he's not a faithful minister. He forfeits his authority. The civil magistrate is no different 
And this is true, regardless of the spiritual condition of the ruler. Remember that Jesus, what Jesus said to Pilate during his trial. Pilate asked him, are you speaking to me? Do you know that I, do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answers, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. He says, wait a minute, big boy. You're not thinking clearly. Who put you in this authority? Do you imagine that it was your conniving that got you to be the emperor of Rome or a governor in the, uh, in the Roman Empire? No, God put you there. You have no authority but from God. And you need to think clearly about what you're saying. It's a direct rebuke to Pilate for thinking that he got his own position, that he was in his place because he got himself there. And so that's wrong. The ruler's job is very plain in the scriptures. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I exalt, exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all in authority. Now what, what are we to pray for? that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That's what you're to pray for. When we pray for the president, when we pray for our Congress, when we pray for our rulers, we ask the Lord that they will rule in such a way that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. The ruler's job is primarily to provide an environment where men can mature in righteousness and godliness. The ruler has to, uh, is to defend, in other words, to defend the church so the church can do what God has called it to do, to be a blessing to men, to teach men so they can grow up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, grow up in conformity to him. It is the obligation of the ruler, Martin Bootser, the reformer, said, to protect the church so that it can do its job. That's the whole calling. And this means that the ruler's job is to provide protection against the enemies of peace wherever they may be, inside the country or outside the country. They need to protect us from enemies invading. So we need a defense. We need the, them to defend us. They need to protect us from criminals within. We need justice and law enforcement inside so that order can be maintained and that an environment can be, can be there for a peace so that we can do and fulfill the great commission that God has given to the people, to, to his people as in the church. So the magistrate is to protect the liberties of the people so that the country uh, as an environment that's conducive to growing in conformity to Jesus. That's his job, and that's, that's what he's to be focused upon. It's the responsibility of rulers, then, to lead a nation in the ways of righteousness. This is the only way of prosperity and security. A nation is exalted by righteousness. We've already looked at Proverbs 14. The throne is a, that establishes evil by statute would have no fellowship with God. Psalm 94. Shall the throne of iniquity, which devises evil by law, that is, it actually legislates evil instead of good, what do you think is going to happen to that country? God says, it will have no fellowship with me, that's for sure. It's an abomination for kings to commit wickedness. Look at Proverbs 13. It's an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. Who says that you're not to be a Christian country? Who dares to think that it's okay that we not be distinctively Christian as a country? Why is, it, why is it, where did we get this idea that you hear everywhere that we don't want to be a Christian country, we just want to have freedom? You can't have freedom if you're not a Christian country. Freedom is not something that's just a commodity everybody has. Only Christians understand that. Only God gives that. Jesus is the one who said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Otherwise, you're a slave and you'll be ruled by tyrants. God judges all nations and rulers who rebel against him and cast off his word. And as citizens, we have to be faithful and oppose every leader who rebels against his calling as a minister of God. You are commanded to love your neighbors, that is, love your country. There's a real, genuine biblical patriotism that ought to be true of us. 
we have to be the true friends of our nation. But that means if you really are a patriot, that means you will not tolerate your nation's sins. And you won't tolerate leaders who rebel against God and who, who establish wickedness by law. We have to be faithful to God and not submit to men who are leading the country to destruction. To to think that patriotism means my country right or wrong is idolatrous. That's not what patriotism means. Patriotism is a love of country, a love for your neighbor, a love for the the best things that you want the country to do well. We're seeking the well-being of our country. But that means we have to oppose our country when it sins, just as much as we support it when it does what is right, and we will defend it and we care about it, and we love its history, and we, and we don't excuse the sins of the past, nor do, we, nor do we make up sins that weren't there. We are to submit to all lawful authority and the lawful exercise of authority. To refuse to do so is to rebel against God. But our allegiance to God requires that we refuse to submit to tyrants who seek to take God's place and who legislate evil by statute. So if the state refuses to be a minister of God, that is, administering his law, and starts seeking to establish its own laws, seeking to usurp authority that God has not given it, at that point it loses all right to the honor and obedience of its citizens. And this leads us back now to Matthew 22. This is Jesus' point. The Jews, of course, we know are trying to trick Jesus. It says that, Matthew tells us, that they tried to trap him in his words. And so they ask him, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? The question, you see, was a great controversial question among the people of Israel because the people of Israel didn't like paying taxes to Rome. It was extremely offensive. The Jews saw Roman taxation as an illegitimate expression of Roman authority over Israel, and they didn't think Rome had any authority over. So it's a clever question. However Jesus answers it, it looks like they can get him in trouble. Whichever way he says it, if he says, yes, we should pay taxes, then they can go to the Jews and say, do you hear what this guy says? He's not a true friend of Israel. How How can you dare look to him as a rabbi? How can you even worse look to him as Messiah when he hates Israel like this? And if he says, no, we shouldn't pay taxes, then they can go to the Romans and say, hey, we got a guy here who's who's really encouraging disobedience and rebellion. He's bad. You need to arrest him. And that's the plan. But look at the brilliance, the wisdom of Jesus. He gives an answer that avoids the trap completely. He asks to see a coin. And he says, whose picture is on the coin? Whose picture is this? And they say, "Um, Caesar's. And he says, okay, your question answer is very simple. Render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and render to God the things that belong to God. In other words, at this point in history, guys, God has placed us under the rule of Rome and of Tiberius Caesar. Caesar, like all rulers, has been given authority to rule by God. And within that authority, God has given Caesar the authority to tax And thus it is right that we should give to Caesar those things that he has authority to demand. When Caesar acts within the bounds of his God-given authority, he is acting as God's minister, and to refuse obedience is to disobey God himself. But, now here's where it gets offensive for Caesar, render to God the things that that belong to God. Who did Caesar say he was? He said he was God. He was the Lord of all. He was the Lord of lords and the King of kings is what Caesar claimed for himself. Jesus says, well, he's being pretty silly. Obviously, you know he's not God, right? Everybody knows that. So you render to Caesar the things that legitimately belong to Caesar, but you render to God what belongs to God, and you never give to to Caesar what belongs to God. Is that true? Is that right? That's the way this works. To give to Caesar what belongs to God is blasphemy. All authority comes from God and must be exercised according to God's will. God not only expects us to submit to Caesar when he exercises legitimate authority, but he also expects Caesar to recognize his position as God's minister and to be faithful to that position. And when Caesar is not, he is disobeying God himself. 
Caesar doesn't have comprehensive authority. He has no right to claim ownership of all things. He has no right to expect men to acknowledge him as God. Just as you render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, you d Caesar's, you dare not give to Caesar the honor that should be given to God because he is not God. So, after all, whose image do you bear would be the question that is unspoken here. You bear God's image. The coin is, has Caesar's image. Okay, we can give that to him. We cannot give to Caesar what belongs to God. Caesar didn't create you. Caesar didn't redeem you. Caesar doesn't give you life. He doesn't bless you and protect you. He doesn't provide for you. And we must not pretend that our lives depend on his favor. They do not. Therefore, our first calling is to be faithful to our creator. Fear God, not Caesar. And part of your calling to fear God is, to, is refusing to give submission that is due to him alone to any man or group of men. So Jesus' answer does a couple of things. He forbids lawless revolution. In other words, you cannot, you're not to disobey lawful authority, even if you don't like it. To do that is to sin against God. But neither can you support rulers that usurp authority that is not properly there. So he says you can't engage in lawless revolution and tyrants, rulers, can't rule tyrannically. They have no right to usurp authority they haven't been given. If Caesar demands require disobedience to God, we must not only denounce it, we must refuse to obey it. And so throughout the Bible you see illustrations of this, don't you? When the Hebrew midwives were commanded by Pharaoh to kill all the male children in Israel, they refused, and they deceived Pharaoh. Far better to, and in doing that, you see people always say, oh, they shouldn't have lied. Look, what are you, what are you talking about here? They are being faithful to God. God blesses them for what they did. They were putting their own lives in danger because it, they, they, they tell uh, Pharaoh, oh, the Hebrew women, they're not like these uh, sissy Egyptian women, let us tell you. They have babies, and we can they can have babies before we can even get there. Well, that wasn't so, but the Lord said, you, because they feared God and not Pharaoh, he blesses them. He gave all the midwives their own families in, in blessing. But they were endangering themselves, you see. When you deceive rulers for the sake of protecting the innocent and putting yourself in danger, that is legitimate. That's why uh, when, the, uh, when some of the... Uh, the Dutch uh, hid the Jews in their basement and told the Nazis when the Nazis came to the door, they go, are there any Jews here? They go, wow, we have Jews. How long has it been since we've seen a Jew? They didn't, they didn't go into it, and God blessed them. They, do it, they did exactly what they should have. Same way that Rahab, right? The, the king's spies of Jericho are sent. He, she hides Israel's spies refuses to give them to the king's men. She endangers her life for the good of the kingdom, and God blesses her. She could have stayed out of trouble and turned everybody over, but she didn't. She feared God. The same is true of Daniel's friends when they're commanded to fall down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's statue. They refuse. They knew it was far better to die than to deny God and submit to a tyrant. And when Daniel, of course, was forbidden by the edict of a king to pray to any god except to Darius the king, Daniel immediately, when he hears it, he goes back to his room, opens the windows, faces Jerusalem, and prays so that he can show everybody, I'm not submitting to that. I'm not going to do what you just said. I will worship even if the state says I can't. He would not honor the tyranny of the king. And, of course, God blesses him. And, and, of course, you have the example of the apostles when they were arrested and forbidden to speak or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. Peter and John reply that we must obey God rather than men. We're not going to stop doing this. You, can't, you don't have the authority to tell us that. To refuse submission to tyrannical rulers is not revolutionary activity. It is not disobedience to God. It is obedience to God. It is upholding the authority of God and insisting that God's sovereignty and godly order has to be acknowledged and maintained. The magistrate who refuses to rule as God's minister is the revolutionary in this case. And so Paul's words in Romans 13 were not an endorsement of unlimited submission to tyranny, but the opposite. It's in fact a direct attack 
on the prevailing politics of the day. The Roman emperor claimed unlimited authority. Paul denounces this view and declares that Caesar is God's minister and is to act as God's representative applying God's word. And by implication, if Caesar acts like God, doing his own will, he is forfeiting the right to be obeyed. That is why all tyrants throughout history hate Romans 13, and that's why the first people they go after are the church, the members of the church, because we believe that Romans 13 is God's word. This is why uh, Herbert Marcuse said that the, ple the place you need to begin the cultural revolution is the church. Everybody else is easily intimidated, but not the church. And therefore, they have to be, uh, they have to be undermined first before any revolution can go forward. That's why the Chinese killed the Christians. That's why the Russians did the same thing. That's why the, uh, the Cambodians did the same thing, the Khmer Rouge, every time. Now, I'm afraid that they're overestimating us in our day, but hopefully we would be bold in the same way. But it's for this reason that the Reformation Church spent a great deal of time and thought on the whole idea of resistance to tyranny because, of course, they had lived under tyrants. Some of the most powerful works defending the freedom against governmental tyranny were, the, were written in the 16th century. So you have things like uh, the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin in 1536 and the, the treatise, amazing treatise, De Regno Christi, The Kingdom of Christ by Martin Bootser. 1550, Barton Bootser says there the true legitimate ruler is the one who worships God and who honors his word. Uh, then you have things like the, the Huguenot work, Vindicae Contra Tyrannos, um, written by, we don't know who, it was anonymous, Junius Brutus is the, is the uh, name given us, but that's not who, of course, wrote it. And then you have things like in the 17th century, things like Politica, by Johannes Althusius in 1603 and Lex Rex uh, by Samuel Rutherford in 1643 and Areopagitica Ariopa, by John Milton in 1644 and Discourses Concerning Civil Government by Algernon Sidney in 1681. These were built upon by the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. And, um, and later on in the 18th century, you had writings like those of St. George Tucker, who wrote the, uh, a view of the Constitution of the United States in 1803, and a man like William Rawl, who wrote a view of the Constitution, 1825. That was the textbook used in West, at West Point. These men were friends of some of the founding fathers, they understood, they were, they were contemporaries with those men, they, they knew what they intended, and they explained the Constitution in ways that, um, that we have all forgotten in our day. These are all important works, and there are many, many more that were done to try to make sure that our country was clear. All these works build upon the teachings of God's Word. Rulers do not have divine rights. They are not equal to God, they are accountable to him as his ministers, and they are not allowed to follow their pleasure, but rather they are obligated to be faithful ministers of God. You see, in our country, we actually have a ceremony that ritualizes this reality. When our president is, is uh, inaugurated into office, one of the things he does, or he's supposed to do, is to have a Bible there, his wife or a judge or somebody holds it, and he puts his hand on the Bible. It used to be an open Bible, and it used to be open to Deuteronomy 28. You know what Deuteronomy 28 has in it, right? The blessings and the curses. If you're faithful, God is blessing you. If you're not faithful, if you break this covenant vow, you're going to be, bring curses upon yourself and your country. Well, the president then takes an oath publicly with his hand upon the Bible, one hand lifted up to heaven, acknowledging God's witness, God is a witness, the other hand placed upon the Bible, open to Deuteronomy 28, as you see there, with, this is the first inauguration, uh, well, under the Constitution of the President. George Washington puts his hand on the Bible, open there to Deuteronomy 28, uh, and he solemnly swears to uphold the Constitution in the name of God, 
and in the presence of the people. This is a covenant ceremony. It constitutes the fact that the elected official pledges to uphold the covenant agreement with the people, acknowledging God's rule over him and his responsibility to serve faithfully as God's minister to the people following the agreed upon constitution that he will do everything he can to uphold this constitution and do nothing that will undermine this constitution or do anything contrary to it. And you see the implication of that is he is calling down God's judgment upon him if he fails to keep his word. The covenantal nature of civil authority also lays the groundwork for resistance and the removal of tyrants. And so, in the Huguenot work that I mentioned a while ago, Vindicae Contra Tyrannos, it says this, there is ever and in all places a mutual and reciprocal obligation between the people and the prince. The one promises to be a good and wise prince, the other to obey faithfully, provided he govern justly. Therefore, if the prince fail in his promise, the people are exempt from obedience. The contract is made void, the right of obligation of no force. Vindicate Contra Tyrannos gives us an exposition of the Bible, if you've never read it. He just goes through the scriptures and brings out these principles of covenantal authority. But the question remains, you see, how do we know that this is happening? You know, I may feel, I may get offended by something, but that doesn't mean that I have the right to declare a man is usurping authority. How do we know when a ruler is doing that and forfeiting submission? This is where, again, the Bible and the Constitution helps us. The Bible enables us to distinguish rebellion from obedience. It exposes sin and unbelief and instructs us in what we have to give to God and what we have to give to Caesar. And our Constitution specifies, it spells out the the powers and the authority of government created by the individual states through their representatives. The Constitution delineates governmental authority so that we're not left to our private judgments or opinions or our feelings about something. We can see clearly when the actions of a ruler are illegal and illegitimate. And this is why written constitutions uh, are important and why Christian cultures have produced written constitutions. It was, it was something that, um, that this country especially was founded upon because of having to deal with so many tyrants in the past. We come from all kinds of places and we knew what it was to, to have men uh, act tyrannically. And so it follows, we follow the pattern of God's covenant with Israel. God gave Israel his word, his law, but then he had it written down. And so we have uh, men like St. George Tucker giving us a rationale for a written constitution. He said, power when undefined soon becomes unlimited. And the disquisition of social rights where there is no text to resort to for their explanation is a task equally above ordinary capacities of the body of the people. But as it is necessary to the preservation of a free government established upon the principles of a representative democracy that every man should know his own rights, it is also indispensably necessary that he should be able on all occasions to refer to them. In other words, to be able to say, look, here's where it says it. I'm not making it up. I'm not making an unrighteous judgment. I'm not following opinions or feelings. This is what it says. You're not doing this. And we can prove it. England didn't have a written constitution. And so these men were concerned about how many times the kings over, overstepped their authority. But you see, this is why we must not only know, but insist that the government follow and adhere to the constitution we had. To refuse to allow the continued disregard. Uh, we have to refuse to allow the continued disregard and intentional breaking of the Constitution in our day. And and you see, we do this not because politics is the most important thing. Politics is always at least number four on our list. It's not the most important thing. But what is important is living to the glory of God. That is the most important thing. And in a sinful world, we cannot live to the glory of God without an honest government that provides a climate conducive for the church to do its God-given work in teaching us to live in all godliness and reverence. Government can't save us, but it can destroy us. We have to take and make every appeal accessible to us to halt unconstitutional activity. 
And if that fails, if we make appeals and they don't listen, then we appeal to our lesser magistrates to interpose themselves between us and the unconstitutional, tyrannical acts of government. We'll talk about this later on, but interposition is important here, and it's part of the it's part of the covenantal theory of uh, ideal of government. Refusal to obey unconstitutional acts is not rebellion. Someone, some have said that we have no right to disobey unless the government requires disobedience to God. That is not true. That is false. We obviously have to disobey when government requires us to disobey God. But the fact is that governments are required also, they have agreed to do things according to our agreed constitution. And when they go contrary to the constitution, they also forfeit the submission of the people. In Federalist number 13, uh, 33, sorry, Alexander Hamilton said this. He, he, he's talking about any acts of usurpation. He said any act that's contrary to the constitution is a usurpation. It is grasping an authority that's not yours. Hamilton states that if the government goes beyond its expressly delegated powers, such acts will be merely acts of usurpation and will deserve to be treated as such. That is to say, such acts are illegitimate, they're unlawful, and they may be justly ignored. We are presently watching another effort to do what tyrants have always done, which is to cast away the authority of God and to pull Jesus from his throne. Nearly every day we witness another effort to undermine biblical society as our president and the people of his administration seek to be like God, legislating a new evil morality, calling evil good and good evil. And it's clear that we are being called to respond. And we are being called to respond in the way that God called Israel to respond. We have to repent ourselves for our sins. It's because of our sins that we have such terrible, ignorant, wicked rulers, unprincipled men. We have to repent first because we have to acknowledge this is ultimately our fault. Not totally, but ultimately. Calling our rulers then to repentance after that. Calling them, like uh, God says, like God calls to the rulers of the earth in Psalm 2, calling our rulers to kiss the son as the king of kings and lord of lords, lest he be angry and they perish in the way. To refuse to resist usurpations, the usurpations that we are witnessing, is to deny the lordship of Christ. You see, liberty is a kingdom issue. True freedom is not the freedom to do anything you desire, but the freedom to live as God has commanded us to live. Without the freedom to obey and glorify God, to enjoy him, life is not possible because that's what life consists of. If we can't do that, we are not living. We are zombies. We're walking dead. God ordained evil magistrates. I'm sorry, God ordained civil magistrates to provide an environment where life is possible. The ability to protect this true role of the magistrate then is vital. Without it, the church is not, allow, not going to be able to pursue its calling. And this is why the church has always viewed constitutions as important and foundational to the Great Commission. Jesus is Lord of all the nations. All the kings are required to bow to him and to do his will because he is Lord. So the issue again today, as it always has been, is that question, who is Lord? Is Christ king? Is he king only so long as those in, uh, in the state allow him to be king? Whose word is law? That was the question the Jews and the Romans confronted God's people with in the first century. And now we are more and more being confronted with the same question today. Are we going to respond? How are we going to respond? Well, the answer is, of course, we're going to respond by saying Jesus is Lord. Period. Okay, you have any comments or observations or questions, anything that you want to mention? Yeah, Will? <laughs> 
Yeah, we take the stay in regard. First, we appeal to them and say, this is, you have no authority to do this. This is contrary to the Constitution. And we appeal so you bring, so we can, and hopefully, uh, that's why you have always appeals from court decisions. You appeal it, and we'll appeal it. We should appeal it all the way. There should be lawsuits brought against some of this legislation that's, that is being considered and being passed. If they pass, packing the Supreme Court, I think, challenge it. Challenge it at the Supreme Court. Uh, if they pass uh, the Equality Act, challenge it. It's unconstitutional. It's not only ungodly, it's unconstitutional. But we have to challenge it there. And if that fails, then we go to our states and say, all right, you need to protect us. So pass a law that says we are not submitting to that unconstitutional act. This is called nullification, and it's a constitutional action. And our state should, at that point, protect us by saying, like some states are already doing, we're not, we're not going to allow you to take guns. We're not going to allow it. Just to let you know, we're not submitting to that. That's unconstitutional. That is the right of every state to do that. And we need to make sure that our state does that. And failing that, if they say, no, we're going to do that, then we go to our county sheriffs and say, sheriff, we want you to stand up for the Constitution. You're our last hope. And the sheriff is the last hope at this point. And we appeal to him to defend us. And he can say, you're not doing it in this county. You're not. Like some sheriffs have done uh, around the country. They're saying, that's not happening here. Okay, he is the chief authority in the county, and that's our last restraint. Now, if he uh, refuses to defend us, we, we then are saying, we, our appeal then is to the Lord to protect us and, and destroy our enemies uh, and pray the imprecatory psalms. But there are steps to take that have to be done. That's why we, right now, yeah, you could go to, I mean, you could, if I could call up the president and he would answer the phone, I could say, man, you're doing everything all this unconstitutionally. He'd go, ha, 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 who cares? Who are you? It wouldn't matter. But we can get states to oppose this, and we should. Every state should pass a law saying we're not doing it. They don't even have to pass a law. They can just say we don't do it. Okay, any others? Okay, very good. We're a little bit behind. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, thank you again that you're the one who is the king. Uh, we thank you that we don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. We don't have to lose our appetites. We don't have to be frustrated. We can sleep at night and rejoice and have fun together and feast. Thank you for giving us that peace that passes all understanding because we do know you're doing your holy will. No matter how bad things look, no matter how frustrating it gets, help us to rest in you every day, reminding ourselves that you do your, you're always bringing about your purposes. So help us to worship you, to be glad, to love one another, and to give thanks day by day as we see you work your goodwill here on earth as you always do in heaven. Hear our prayers. Bless us as we go to our homes. For Jesus' sake, amen.